I wish to thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction. It is uh, uh, a great pleasure to be here and to listen to so many interesting lectures. And uh, especially, I am glad to note that there are so many physicists who invade other fields of science. We have just heard today a couple of excellent lectures about biology, and uh, the physicists have uh, uh, made all, presented all sorts of excuses for going there. I think that they do not need any excuse for this, but uh, I should like to try to follow the same approach, namely to um, mm, try to uh, go into a field where uh, I uh, am an outsider, uh, and um, this means that I would like to present the views of a plasma physicist on cosmology uh, and uh, astrophysical problems in general. As an excuse for doing so, I should perhaps mention that everybody, everybody knows that 99.9999999% uh, of the universe consists of a magnetized plasma and uh, therefore it may be uh, allowed for a plasma physicist to present his views there. Um, the, we have listened to uh, wonderful lectures about cosmology, uh, and uh, it has been stated here uh, the general agreed fact that uh, the Big Bang cosmology is the cosmology which explains everything. And um, I am, of course, very impressed by this cosmology. It is based on the, the general theory of relativity. And in the year when uh, the 100th anniversary of Einstein is celebrated, I need not, uh, 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 I need not stress to you how wonderful, how beautiful the general theory of uh, the general relativity is. And when you listen to the presentation of uh, uh, Professor Dirac, of his version of the um, general, of the uh, Big Bang theory, you are also very impressed. Uh, of course, the general feeling is that it is a beautiful theory which explains the whole evolution of the universe from the Big Bang, the Urknall, when all matter was, we have now, was concentrated in one point, in one singular point. There are, of course, a number of, of difficulties, which is, it is a little, uh, 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 which uh, uh, there are a number of things, I, it is a little difficult to understand, namely that the whole world, which we see, Linda and Bordensee and the whole Earth and the planets and the sun and the galaxies and all that once was once condensed into a very small volume, as small as this or as small as this or even still smaller because a singular point is very, very small. And, um, but uh, I take the authority of the Einstein and Professor Dirac that it must have been so. And furthermore, uh, you hear the detailed description of what happened during the first three minutes after the Big Bang. And uh, that is described, as you know, in detail. You are a little surprised to find that the accurate dating of this is uh, not uh, uh, so well known. Uh, Professor Dirac said that some people uh, say that it was 10 billion years ago, 
and other 80, 18 billion years ago, and I think this uh, states uh, this states the general uh, situation. There is large uncertainties in certain respects, but of course not about what happened during the first three minutes. But with this, uh, uh, and then, of course, you ask yourself what happened before these three minutes. And then I haven't got any answer yet what happened before. Well, this has no meaning because uh, uh, nothing existed there. And uh, how did all this come into, into being? There are some people who say that this proves the existence of God because it was, must have been God who created all this uh, at a certain moment. And this means that we mix science and theology. We come in, into the borderline there, and uh, this is a thing which uh, perhaps is somewhat dangerous. But as I said, the, most, uh, the strongest impression is the wonderful beauty of the whole theory. It explains everything. However, beauty, beauty is sometimes dangerous, also in science and especially in cosmology. If we look at the history of science, there has been other cosmologies which have been wonderfully beautiful. Take the six-day creation. Wasn't that a one, isn't that a wonderful cosmology? It, uh, uh, it, uh, uh, and still, it is, in spite of its beauty, uh, it, it isn't believed very much, at least not in the scientific community. And take the wonderful Ptolemaic system, which was generally accepted for thousand years or so, with the harmony of the spheres and crystal spheres revolving, that was also very beautiful. But uh, still, there are very few people who believe in it, except, of course, those who believe in astrology, and that is perhaps more than those who believe in uh, science, in, yeah, in astronomy. But that is, but these are outside uh, extramuros. They are not, uh, do not belong to the scientific community. But I think that um, the, the reason why this very beautiful cosmologies are not, uh, are not uh, accepted anymore is that they are not reconcilable with observations because uh, science is, after all, uh, an empirical, uh, to, uh, to some extent empirical. We have wonderful theories of which we have heard so much, but there is also uh, empirical evidence, and how does that agree with the, uh, the uh, theories in this respect? We have heard that there are convincing proofs for the Big Bang cosmology, and we have heard that in some cases there is expected to be a convincing uh, proof of it in a few months, but uh, uh, let us see a little how uh, we how all this uh, this um, how uh, uh, much to what extent the observations uh, support the big bang. I think that the general impression is that all really good observations support big bang, and all bad observations contradict it. But uh, what is the definition of a good observation? It is an observation which confirms the Big Bang. And, and uh, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, uh, definition of a bad observation, an uninteresting observation, is uh, an observation which brings uh, Big Bang into some difficulties. We have heard about these um, wonderful models. It is a homogeneous model, uh, which uh, is the basis for the, the uh, Big Bang. It is derived from the th general theory of relativity. And um, so the first question is, 
is really the universe uh, uh, uniform? Is it isotropic? If you go out in the night and look at the stars, uh, you don't you you see something which is not at all uniform. Can I have the first slide? But that is only a local anomaly. It is only something which happens here in our close neighborhood. Okay. Uh, and um, if you go out and have a, if you have a look on the galaxy, our galaxy, this does not either give you an impression of a uniform distribution of matter. But uh, this is again uh, a local anomaly. If we go out further, we should, according to the theory, to the, uh, be able to apply a uniform uh, uh, homogeneous theory. That means that such islands should be distributed uniformly in space. No, it does not, because the galaxies are lumped together in, uh, in, uh, in um, groups of galaxies, and these are lumped together in, in um, uh, clusters of galaxies, and the clusters of galaxies are not either uniformly distributed, uh, they are <coughs> lumped together in super clusters. And that is as far as our information goes, because if we go to still larger size, we don't know anything with certainty from observations of this kind. Can I have the, the, projector, the projector on here? This is a diagram by de Vaucouleur, which gives the experimental the observational results, correlation between the maximum density and the radius of a sphere. And you see here, if you have uh, uh, these represent galaxies and the average density in, in them is uh, uh, something like 10 to the minus 23. These are groups of galaxies and, and uh, clusters of galaxies. And this is the last largest uh, unit you can measure that is a super, uh, super uh, cluster of uh, super clusters of galaxies. They come down here. And you see, this, does, this means that we have rather a hierarchy of lower and lower densities when we go out to very large regions. Here we are out on uh, close to 10 to the 26 centimeters, and the Hubble radius, the radius of the universe, is called 10 to the 28. So we are have here uh, uh, still well, a couple of oh, two orders of magnitude to go. And about this region, we don't know anything from galactic observations how uniform it is. It is quite possible that uh, off, uh, from here, further out, we have a uniform density that is about uh, 10 to the minus 29, which I think is the, the uh, figure which uh, Professor Dirac quoted. However, if you take, you can also, without being in disagreement with any observational fact, continue the extrapolation here, and that brings you down to 10 to the minus 34, uh, 32 at this distance, which is three or four orders of, of magnitude below this value. So we obviously here have an amplitude uh, about which the observations don't tell us anything. There is nothing wrong. We cannot say that the Big Bang uh, uh, uniform uh, picture is wrong, but we can also, uh, also accept such a solution. And we should just, uh, uh, we, uh, it, uh, it is of interest to see what we result we can reach if we take the other alternative. So it means that the homogeneity of very large uh, of the universe or meta galaxies, is, it also always uh, sometimes is called, meaning just that part of, of uh, the galaxy which uh, with the, of the universe we explore here, uh, that um, <coughs> Uh, this 
uh, uniformity is not known with any, uh, is not proved uh, by observations of galaxies. What is the main proof of it? Well, it is the most important phenomenon which has been discovered for, the, for quite a few years in astrophysics, namely the black body radiation, which is completely isotropic, and that shows that uh, that can that shows that uh, the the um, uh, universe as a whole must be completely isotropic. It agrees with the Big Bang model, and this is actually the strongest support that, that ever there is. It is, as far as I know, the only support there is for it. Or perhaps I should say was, because one year ago there happened a very regrettable thing, namely that this radiation turned out not to be isotropic. <coughs> it, uh, uh, it is, it is may very well be due to a local anomaly, of course, uh, but uh, it is, if you correct for the rotation of the galaxy, you still get a large anisotropy of the order of uh, velocity of uh, 800 or 1,000 kilometers per second. And if you then correct for the motion of the, uh, the, our, uh, our <coughs> galaxy in relation to other galaxies in the Virgo cluster, which is the larger unit, you do not either get any, uh, any uh, better isotropy. So it, it must be some still larger unit where this, uh, un this unit, this anisotropy uh, uh, is caused. So I'm not quite sure that we could rely on this either. Then comes um, the Hubble expansion. Uh, the Big Bang uh, says that everything was condensed in a singular point, and from that uh, the galaxies flew out in all directions. And there is no, uh, this is uh, correct, with, uh, uh, at least to the extent that the, there is a Hubble expansion, the galaxies move outwards. And this is a good diagram which shows uh, uh, the relation between the distance, it is measured uh, uh, by corrective apparent magnitude of the galaxies, and this is the velocity. And you see that these points fit very well on a straight line, which it should do according to the Big Bang uh, theory. They should all be be uh, uh, lie on a straight line, and of course we have we have observational errors because these measurements are very difficult to make. <coughs> However, if we take the individual observations here, we have the distance and we have the velocities, and from that we could construct a diagram uh, how these have moved under the assumption, which is very reasonable, that they haven't changed their velocity. This is now the distance from us, and this is time, and you see that if you go back in time, uh, these are all coming closer together. Now every individual point here is used for such a straight line, and they come together here. So there is no doubt that uh, our metagalaxy is expanding at present. However, is it, uh, does this expan uh, expansion necessarily derive from a, a Big Bang here? It's quite possible. You cannot rule that out because these could very well be observational errors. It might be that everything has derived uh, has originated from one point here, and then it has gone out uh, like this, and uh, the, the uh, <coughs> minimum size which you get here may very well be due to observational errors. 
However, we cannot say that from observations it is possible to conclude this. We can conclude that once the Meta galaxy uh, was much smaller than now, at the Hubble time, 10 billion years or so, it uh, was something like one-tenth or less than that. It could be zero, it could be a singular point, but it could very well also be much larger. So uh, this means that um, we, uh, we, if we try to construct uh, uh, an earlier state of the, our meta galaxy uh, from observations, we could do that. Uh, that could lead to the Big Bang model, but it could also, according to this, lead to a rather drastically different picture. Uh, you have here the Hubble radius, the Hubble density, and so, so on. And here is, is beta. That is the velocity, uh, the, the velocity of the different galaxies uh, which have been measured. And the galaxies for, for which one have, has measured the redshift are, uh, most of them, are well below 0.3 of the velocity of light. That means that this is the size, uh, 3 times 10 to the 27, if we take the Hubble radius to 10 to the 28. Professor Dirac, Dirac gave a, 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 a model in which he said that he discussed especially the, uh, the part of the universe which uh, was receding with a velocity which was less than half the, of the velocity of light, which we can take for this. And here we can take 0.4 as some sort of average. This is only to show you what one may get in such a way. Then you see that the, the total rest mass of the the uh, uh, meta galaxy is given here, and the rest mass energy, rest mass multiplied by the square of the velocity of light, comes down to 483. Uh, uh, the units is 10 to the 70 arc. If you you can also calculate the kinetic energy of this, and the kinetic energy comes out to be. 19, it is about 5%. So the known, the part of the universe which we have observed with any degree of certainty has a kinetic energy which is about 5%. It's a little different here of the, uh, uh, of the rest mass. So in some way, we, we need to have an, an energy put into the uh, meta galaxy, which gives you 20% about. And this, from that, we can construct, I don't have so much time, I see that goes very rapidly. This is a table of uh, uh, what we have here. We, what is interesting is to see, this is the, the minimum size of the Meta galaxy, and what is interesting is that uh, the, we are, even at the minimum size, uh, uh, 100 times outside the Schwarzschild limit, which means that the correction for the general relativity effect is only 1%. What does this mean? It means that if we go out to the galaxy, in the galaxy, uh, we, we of course have measured general relativity effects in our close neighborhood. If we go out to study the, the uh, behavior of the galaxy, no one uh, applies general relativity. Every, every, all the motions there can be, apply, can be used, can be uh, calculated with classical mechanics. If we go out further out, as soon as we are far from the uh, general, from the Schwarzschild limit, we can use uh, classical mechanics, we can use uh, Euclidean geometry with a high degree of certainty. So actually, with this model, we have 
1% correction for the general relativity and something like 10, perhaps 25% correction for the special theory of relativity. So you see that this is, uh, this is, is um, a possible model uh, which, as I said, is just as well reconcilable with the observations, uh, with the observational data as the Big, Big Bang Theory, as far as I can see. However, now comes another thing. Certainly hot here. Uh, if you, and that is that there are so many other very interesting phenomena which have been observed in the, uh, in the, in astrophysics. And one of the most dramatic events, dramatic things, is the QSOs, the quasars. And the quasars have velocities, uh, redshifts, which are much larger than the galaxies. Under the assumption that the, the, the quasars, the QSOs, have uh, uh, a redshift which is due, which is cosmological, that is due to the Big Bang, then you can go out from a point from point uh, uh, three, the velocity of light, point four, out to the uh, almost the velocity of light. You have red shifts which are up to two or three or perhaps even more. So it is a critical question whether the red shifts of the QSOs is cosmological or not. And the red shifts, the, uh, the QSOs are a very, very interesting, very fascinating uh, uh, thing to study. And I have here a, a short summary of, of their properties. They are not really introduced very much in the general cosmological um, uh, discussion. And the reason for this is simply that they are very awkward to the Big Bang cosmology. There is no evident explanation of it. And you can see that uh, they, they are causing considerable trouble. The, the uh, QSOs have very large releases of energy. It is of the order of the annihilation of one solar mass per year, and in some cases, still more. They have red shifts, which are very large. And the controversial question are these red is are these red shifts cosmological or are they caused by some other other uh, uh, um, uh, mechanisms? And uh, then you can see uh, that uh, what we should take out here is um, is especially that uh, uh, some uh, QSOs are located close to galaxies. And in certain cases, they have the same redshift as the galaxy. But there are many cases, and undoubtedly uh, very convincing evidence, that there are QSOs closely re close to uh, galaxies, but they have very different redshifts. Um, this is, uh, is, uh, uh, has been demonstrated by more measurements by Margaret Burbage. The Burbages have uh, uh, very strong e evidence for the non-cosmological redshifts, and uh, Arp in Pasadena has made beautiful measurements of this. So there must be mechanisms by which these uh, uh, QSOs get uh, up to close to the velocity of light without being uh, uh, these velocities being produced by uh, the cosmology, by the Big Bang. And you can see what requirements one has here. The, if, if, you have the, if you take the enormous energy release, which uh, are measured, and you introduce the condition that this energy is emitted in one direction, then you can get the, the bodies up to these velocities. This is one possible suggestion to, uh, to get uh, um, to explain the QSOs. The, this means that the very large um, velocities are not which we observe are not necessarily 
cosmological. There are other mechanisms also. But what are these mechanisms? What is the mechanism which produces the energy of the QSOs? We see immediately that uh, the nuclear uh, energy, which is uh, giving us the, ener the energy of the stars, is by far not sufficient. So we have three possibilities. We have either to invent a new law of physics, which gives you these uh, uh, very large energy releases, which we perhaps are a little hesitant to, you, to do. We have two other uh, alternatives left. One is uh, gravitational energy, and the other is annihilation. And um, the gravitational energy, uh, there have been a number of theories according to which black holes produce these large energy releases. But if you try to work out a theory of the QSOs, how they are accelerated, you find that you run into very serious difficulties. And then it's just the possibility that we have annihilation as a, an energy source. And that brings up an uh, interesting problem, namely, is there antimatter in the universe? Is the universe symmetric with regard to matter and antimatter? This has, of course, been, been speculated much about it, and it is uh, uh, Oscar Klein in Stockholm who has who made 20 years ago a systematic effort to uh, show uh, that uh, uh, to make a cosmological model uh, with the uh, uh, with and uh, where you had a symmetry between matter and antimatter. This, um, there has been much objection to that, and this is essentially because if matter and antimatter are mixed in the universe, you would have an enormous uh, uh, gamma radiation, and you will have a very rapid uh, uh, annihilation of it all, so that uh, uh, this could only be uh, a very uh, could, could not persist for a very long time. However, all this depends upon uh, the assumption that you have that uh, the universe is, is homogeneous. We have uh, the, that there is, can be no, uh, that there cannot be separate, uh, separate uh, uh, regions. And this is one of the really dramatic new, if new results of space research. Namely, that the properties of space has changed in a drastic way. And I'm not speaking about the four-dimensional space in the Big Bang theories. I'm speaking about the space which is explored by spacecrafts. Uh, Fifty years ago, uh, it was believed that everything was vacuum outside the celestial bodies. Then it was observed that there was an interstellar medium, interplanetary medium, interstellar medium, and we heard uh, uh, earlier a lecture about that, and it, is, it was then natural to assume that this was a continuous medium. And it was natural to assume that also in our close neighborhood, in uh, the environment of the Earth, the so-called magnetosphere, and in the interstellar interplanetary space, the so-called uh, heliosphere or solar magnetosphere, uh, the, we had a homogeneous medium. This has not, is not correct. This is one of the most, uh, <laughs> most surprising results of space research. If you, ha if you have the magnetic field as a function of the radius from the Earth, this is the Earth, and you go out and measure the magnetic field by spacecrafts, it should decay as r to the minus 3, and that is just what it does, out to about 10 Earth radii, or something like that. Then it suddenly changes to the opposite sign and goes on like this. And this is a most dramatic change it, is, it takes place in a region which is a few uh, cyclotron radii. It is a sudden 
change in the magnetization. So the magnetization here is in that direction, and it is here in that direction. The magnetization of space is not continuous, it is discontinuous. It means that we have a current layer here. And such phenomena have been found, not only in the magnetopores, it has also been found in the magneto tail of the Earth, in the solar equatorial plane, uh, we have an outward directed magnetic field which suddenly changes to the opposite. And again, there is a thin current layer. It has been found in the Jovian, in the Jup Jupiter's magnetosphere, and so on. There is half a dozen places where we observe this. It means that space in our close environment has a cellular structure. There are cells with that magnetization, and there are cells with that magnetization. And it is rather watertight uh, 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 separation surfaces. And um, this, is, um, this means that we have, the, uh, space is no longer um, uniform. It, it consists of a number of cells and they are separated by current layers, and on two sides of the current layer you have different magnetizations, different pressure, different densities, and perhaps you also could have different matters, different kinds of matter. Such uh, thin layers, I, I should just show you here what it is. This is the interplanetary medium, this is the Earth. The Earth had a magnetic field like that, that is 50 years ago, when space, charge, uh, space research started, we got this picture, a neutral sheath here. Now, this is one of the later models. This is the Earth, and you see a number of such layers. Space is drastically different from what it was earlier. And these uh, interfaces cannot be detected, had, were not detected from the Earth. They cannot be detected unless the spacecraft penetrates it. Even if it comes close to it, you see no sign of it. We knew, hence, that space has this structure. How far out? As far as the spacecrafts go. And what is beyond that? No one knows. We cannot prove that it is, has the same cellular structure far, further out. It could very well be that we have a wonderful homogeneous model. But the limit is just as far as spacecrafts go. So perhaps it is easier to assume that this is a general property of space, that it always, everywhere has this structure. And then, time is getting on, we can just see here a model of a layer separating matter and antimatter. We have, suppose that in interplanetary space we have a uh, interstellar space, we have a region containing matter and another region containing antimatter. And then there will be a boundary layer where they keep in contact and they produce uh, <coughs> high energy particles here. And you can, cal you can see that these, the, the number of such particles which are produced is very small. You, can, you have no hope of detecting it from any any uh, difference, any distance, and the, di and the distance which such uh, 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 light and frost layer occupies need only to be uh, a hundred or a, a thousandth or a ten thousandth of a light year. So we can very, very well assume that the cellular, st if, we, if we accept a cellular structure, we can very well think of the universe divided in such regions. And this is important because uh, it's obvious that it has cosmological consequences, quite a few of them, which I shouldn't go into more here. I should only like to say that uh, it seems that with, this, uh, with the, the idea of a symmetric universe, you can explain quite a few of the, uh, of the observations which are embarrassing to the uh, astrophysics and especially to cosmology, namely the enormous release of energy in the, uh, in the uh, USOs, the so-called gamma ray bursts, quite a lot of the X-ray 
radiation and so on, but uh, this will be, be, uh, take us too far. I thank you.